Jeremiah Zaretsky and his wife, Hannah. Raise your hands there. Okay. Way in the back. Okay. And Jeremiah is the branch manager in Chicago. And uh, I know that um, anybody who works for Jews for Jesus has a certain competence. I've never met anybody who didn't have, what should we call it, an above average competence. And they hold them to a very high standard. So I wasn't taking that big a chance by inviting them to come here. And, uh, and he comes recommended by quite a few people. So uh, before I call him forward for the message, I want to call him forward uh, as, uh, to play to help us with the music during the offering. So why don't you come forward and let's welcome them. says your God. Do not forget me. Oh, my children, says your God. Fear not, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you and you are mine. Understand, I am in your darkest hour. I am in your darkest hour.
darkest hour. I am in your darkest hour. Shabbat Shalom. That was pretty good for Palm Springs. I think we can try, try it one more time. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. See, now that's what I was expecting. That was funny. Well, uh, it's so good to be with you at Ohav Shalom, and thank you, Rabbi Paul, for, uh, for inviting us. I just want to honor you and uh, all the work that you have done in the Messianic movement, and of course, being an advocate for Messianic uh, movement in Israel and for Israel. So I just want to honor you and, and thank you for uh, giving me the rare opportunity to come and uh, to share your pulpit. So I'm, I'm grateful and I'm honored. Paul's kind of a, a big macher in, uh, you know, in our movement. He's a big cheese. And uh, so I don't take it lightly that uh, uh, I'm able to come and be able to serve and minister uh, through the word this morning. Uh, so, yeah, from Chicago and just, you know, visiting uh, my in-laws in Azusa, so we left the kids there, but uh, they would have made a memorable impression on you had they come. Um, and uh, it's so good to be in sunny California. Uh, we saw pictures from our, our rabbi um, at, at Dat Hatikva, where we come from, uh, and they got their first snowfall, and so we, we missed it just in time. Um, and uh, both my wife, Hannah, and I grew up in uh, Jewish-believing homes. Uh, she grew up in, in L.A., and I grew up in Toronto, Canada. Uh, are we friendly to Canadians in Palm Springs? Oh, good, good, wonderful. So uh, you never know in America. Um, but I uh, grew up in Toronto, and both of our moms were first-generation Jewish believers. In our family, my mom, uh, her parents were Holocaust survivors in Hungary. My mom was born in Budapest. Unfortunately, she never taught me any Hungarian, but um, uh, my brother and my sister and I grew up and, uh, you know, we knew we were Jewish, we knew our history, we knew our story, um, and from an early age, we believed in Yeshua, um, and I was a bit naive as a second generation Jewish believer growing up thinking, well, this is normal, right? We Jews believe in Jesus, you know, and uh, I went to high school and realized um, that's not the case. Uh, we are definitely not in the majority. Um, had a lot of Jewish kids in my high school and uh, all sorts of different backgrounds, you know, uh, Orthodox Jews and Reformed Jews, and secular Jews and atheist Jews. And even the atheist Jews believed they were more Jewish than me just because I believed in Yeshua. Well, that's okay. It was good training to, uh, to serve with Jews for Jesus uh, going in high school and learning how to uh, articulate my faith. And why do I believe it when all my Jewish friends don't? And so, how many of you know that our faith grows under pressure? Yeah? You know that nothing grows on the mountaintop? But that's where we want to be, isn't it? You know, like Peter, James, and John, they're on the mountain, and there's Moses and Elijah, and they're like, well, let's make a sukkah. Let's just, let's just memorialize this moment. And yet, nothing grows on the mountaintop. The way God tended things to be is that they grow in the valley where we don't really like to be. I mean, you guys live in the desert, so you know what it's like, but, 
but, but spiritually, emotionally, we don't like being in the desert. We don't like being in the valley. That's the hard place. That's where the crushing and the pressing and the refining happens. And, uh, but that's where life grows. And there's something, you know, two things that all of us experience in life um, and find hardship over are finances and relationships. And uh, oftentimes, those two things collide. We, uh, we had a nice van, and um, it got into an accident. Thankfully, everyone was okay. But our nice van wasn't worth a whole lot of money, said the insurance company. And so we didn't get a whole lot back from it. Um, about, so we was totaled, and I needed to find a replacement van. Now, I was a month away from leaving my wife and kids for a week so I could go to San Francisco and, and uh, go to one of our leadership meetings, which is for Jesus. So I had a month. I had a deadline in front of me, a month to find a new van. That couldn't be hard, right? Well, I took vacation days. I spent so much time looking for a new van. I took time off work. We drove all over Chicago, trying different vans. We test drove and took the mechanics. And, and it was like closed door after closed door after closed door. And I was getting frustrated. Any, any of you been there? Maybe not with a van, but maybe with something else. And, and so I had a deadline in front of me. And I had a crashed car behind me. And the more I, harder I tried to fix my problem, to fix this seemingly insurmountable mountain in front of me, the more I failed. And I was getting frustrated at God. And I asked God this question. Maybe you've asked God this question. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> Maybe you could have picked someone else. How many of you know God doesn't do things to us? He allows it to happen. I, I heard this years ago and it's it stuck with me. God allows his wisdom what he can easily prevent by his power. He allows in his wisdom what he can easily prevent by his power. That means whatever is happening to you, whatever is going on in your life today, whatever valley and crushing experience that you're going through, whatever hardship that you're coming into this place with, God is so powerful he can make it go away in a second but he's so wise, he's brought it into your life for you. I want you to think about what hardship, what challenge, what conflict you're coming into Shabbat with this year. I want you to imagine it in your mind, and I want you just to make a fist with your hand, and imagine that challenge in your hand. Think about it. Think about, it's probably not too hard, to think about how frustrating that thing is. Maybe it's a relationship that you're waiting for to change. Maybe it's a financial situation that you are waiting for breakthrough. Maybe it is with your health or family member's health. And you're just waiting, and it seems everything you try to do, it just doesn't move. It just doesn't work. I want you to think about that, and I want you to think about how you feel right now just with your tight fist with that thing, that situation in your hand. We're going to come back to that. Because God allows in his wisdom what he can easily prevent by his power. And I was, I was stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place. And, and I didn't know what to do. And it got down to uh, 24 hours before I was supposed to leave. And I still had no van. And I was desperate. I was praying that God would do it. And you know, our Jewish people felt somewhat like that, but a hundred times worse. If you turn to Exodus 15, uh, Exodus 15 is our passage this morning. Uh, what happens when you're in a conflict? What happens when you're in a hard place? Well, the Jewish people, just to give you some background, they've, uh, we've left Egypt. We've, we took all the gold and, and, and everything from the Egyptians. We had our first Passover. We're, we're heading out. We're freedom. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we got it. And then we get to the Red Sea. And then all of a sudden, 
We, we feel the ground, they feel the ground trembling underneath their feet. They see the dust flying beneath them. And hundreds of Pharaoh's chariots are now racing towards them. And we know the story, you know, Charlton Heston, I mean, Moses uh, opened his hands, he parted the Red Sea. The, all the Israelites, millions of people, walked through the Red Sea. And uh, we get to the other side, and it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> take a long time to bring a million plus people across that uh, part. And then, of course, the Egyptians come after us, and Moses takes his hands away, and the waters fall, they drown, we win, let's eat, right? Um, and then we sing a song. The first thing that we do when we're delivered once again, we sing the song of Moses, Exodus 15. So I want to read just a few verses for you, starting in verse 1. Then Moses sang, and, and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers he has drowned in the sea. The deep waters have covered them, sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger and consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils the waters piled up. The surging waters stood firm like a wall, but the deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. I'll keep reading. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword, and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead to the mighty water. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? awesome in glory, working wonders. You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall upon them. By the power of your arm, they will be still as a stone until your people pass by, O Lord, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling. The sanctuary, O Lord, your hands established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. When Pharaoh's chariots and horses and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over. But the Israelites walked through on the sea of dry ground. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, we thank you that you are not just the God of yesterday, you are the God of today and tomorrow. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You did wonders for our people back then, and you can do wonders for us today. Give us ears to hear your word, not only to hear it, but to do it and to live it. May we live for your glory, in Yeshua's name. Amen. So I love the song of Moses. It's a wonderful song. Um, you notice that um, uh, we we get a lot of our liturgy from the song of Moses. We get the Kamocha. Uh, from here we we recite this passage um, in the Great Hallel during the Passover Seder, and it's sung during the Shachrit service in the morning in the synagogue. So this is actually a Jewish and Christian scholars agree. The Song of Moses is the oldest recorded song in history. How cool is that? Nice. Thank you, Lord. All right. So uh, we have the oldest recorded song in history. And um, what's amazing is uh, it's the Song of Moses, but Moses' name isn't actually even mentioned once. It's all about God. So let me give you kind of three perspectives in which I see the song going. It talks about who God is what he has done, and what he will do. Who God is, that's his character. 
what he has done, that's his work, and what he will do. And so uh, we're going to look at three of these kind of perspectives, and the whole song just kind of hinges on these things, who he is, what he's done, and what he will do. So um, look at verse 1. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. So here we go. And we, we kind of have this sort of, this is a song, right? And so it's poetic. And it's, Moses says, I will sing to the Lord. Uh, why? For he is highly exalted. Um, the horse and the rider he has hurled into the sea. So who, who is God? He is highly exalted. What has he done? He's hurled the horse and the rider into the sea. Look at verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my song. That's who God is, you see? So this whole song, Moses is uplifting the character of God. He says, the Lord is my strength. Say, my strength. Oh, come on, say it like you believe it. The Lord is my strength. It's easier to see who God is for you and for others, isn't it? It's harder to see who he is for me. Well, oh, God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, he's good to you, isn't he? But to me, I don't I don't. Moses says, the Lord is my strength. He, he's taking a personal responsibility for who God is for him. He's my strength and my song. Why? He's become my salvation. So you see this kind of coupling of who God is, his character. He's my strength. What has he done? He's my salvation. He ne el Yeshua ti. Behold, God is my salvation. And I believe that this is the basis of our faith. Our faith rests upon God's character, who he is, and God's works, what he has done. So we see the gospel and we see grace all throughout the Torah and all throughout the Tanakh. And we see it in the Song of Moses. Do you see it? So God is my strength. He's my song. Who he is and what he has done. Uh, look at verse 3. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. So this is who God is. He's my warrior. You know, in, in Western thought, in Greek thought, uh, we, and, and a lot of the, the church has kind of adopted this. We sort of think about God in sort of esoteric ways. But in, in ancient Near Eastern thought, in, in Hebrew thought, it's visual. It's visceral. We're not saying God is my innumerable, invisible one. We're saying God is my rock. He's my salvation. He is a warrior. We don't serve a wimpy God. Amen? We don't serve a, a, a God who, who needs help from us. He is a warrior. That is his name. Look at verse 4. Char Pharaoh's chariots and his army. He's hurled into the sea. So all throughout this song, Moses describes who God is, his character, and what he has done. And, and look at how Moses uh, describes God's salvation uh, in, in this part of our history as he saved us once again from the Egyptians. Verse 4. He is hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's army has drowned in the sea. Look at verse 6. Your right hand. Say right hand. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. Uh, so, I, I like how Moses describes um, God here. It's sort of like um, he, he says he's a warrior. So I sort of imagine this big giant of a warrior god, right, who with his right hand has just just smashing the Egyptians. With his right hand, he, he takes the sea and he commands the sea to move at his bidding. Uh, and uh, it, it's pretty amazing. And now the right hand uh, in, in the Tanakh, and you also see it in Exodus as well, it's a symbolism, right? We know God is spirit, so he doesn't have a right and left hand, but it helps us to understand him better, doesn't it? And, and Moses says, your right hand delivered us. Well, in Exodus 3, um, there's, uh, God is, is telling Moses, um, 
Look at Exodus 3.19. This is interesting. He says, But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. So really, the right hand is symbolism for power, for strength, and for sovereignty. And if you think about it, uh, the Exodus uh, story, the story of, um, of the plagues and God's delivering of our people, it's a story about a power struggle between Pharaoh, who believed he was God, and God, who we knew was God, represented by right hand. So the question was, whose right hand is going to win? Whose hand is going to win? Pharaoh's or God's? And now Moses, in the Song of Moses, says, your, your right hand delivered us. Your right hand threw the army into the sea. Look at verse 8. How else Moses describes our deliverance. He says, by the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. Isn't that funny? I don't know if you find that funny, but I kind of uh, think that that's funny. You just imagine God as this big, giant warrior, right? You know, if you think about the story of David and Goliath, Goliath had all this armor on, right? He didn't come to David with just, this is my body, I'm going to beat you. But, he, and, and, but Moses says, you piled the waters up by just doing this. You sneeze. And the water stood up on edge. Ever watch a scary movie and, and your arm hairs just kind of whoop, go on tingly, right? That, that's exactly what God does. He, he, just with his breath of nostril, you could say God's weakest part was stronger than all of Pharaoh's army. He had 600 of his best period. And what did God do? He just breathed through his nostrils. And that's how powerful our God is. Isn't it amazing? You could have the greatest enemy with all of his best assault on you. And yet, all we need is a God who has literally just needs to breathe his nose and our enemy can be wiped out. Is anything too powerful for our God? Amen? Now, before the Song of Moses, I want to rewind just a little bit because I, it's important to remember how we got to this place. Our people were standing at the sea, looking behind us, realizing we're either going to drown to death by going into that water, or we're going to get speared or trampled to death by the Egyptians. And do you know what happened? When we saw, when we were stuck between a rock and a hard place, when we were stuck between a, an army and a sea, Fear grows up instead of faith. Uh, look at verse uh, 13 in chapter 14. So we're rewinding a little bit of the story here. Chapter 14, verse 13. And, and right before this, all the people are basically freaking out. We're running around with chickens with their heads, like chickens with their heads cut off. And, and of course, what we do in, in our history, as you read it through the Torah, is we blame the leader. <laughs> and, um, and we blame God for sending us that leader who wants us to die in the wilderness. And, uh, and now uh, they said, look, why don't we go back to Egypt? It was comfortable. At least the melons were right. We had good bagels on there. <laughs> but now we're going to die, either drowning to death or being speared to death by the Egyptians. Let's just go back to where it was comfortable. Let's just go back to where we're known. Let's just go back. The moment we start thinking to ourselves, let's just go back, you know the battle's lost in your mind. It's already lost if you want to go back instead of move forward where God wants to take you. Look what Moses tells them, verse 13. Moses answered the people. And some of you, I believe, this morning need to hear these words for you. Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance, the Yeshua, 
of the Lord that he will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. And here are his, the final punch words. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to fight. No, no, doesn't say that. You need only to be frantic and worry. No, doesn't say that. You need only to try to figure it out yourself. No, it doesn't say that either. You need only to be still. Be still. Each of us, we're carrying something in our hands this morning. We're carrying something in our heart. I don't know about you, but I'm carrying it. And I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to be still. It's hard for me not to want to do everything in my power to try to move this thing that's standing in my way. A relationship, finances, friendship, whatever it is, a situation. I want to do everything in my power. And Moses tells them, the Lord will fight. Now here's the irony, friends. Remember, the Israelites left Egypt. Remember how they were dressed? They were armed for battle. We were armed for battle. And yet God said, this one's not your fight. This one, this is not your fight. I'm going to fight for you. I know you're ready, and that's good. Be ready. That's your responsibility. But now, stand still, because I'm going to fight. Sometimes, friends, I think we need to let God fight our battles for us. And you know, some of us are ambitious. We don't only like fighting our own battles in our own strength. We like fighting other people's battles. You know, there's, there's a lot of type A's out there. And, uh, and we don't even wait for people to invite us to fight their battles for them. We're going to help them out. We're going to fight their battles whether they ask for it or not. Yeah? And, and we sort of feel this sense of power although it's a false sense of power. And what we don't realize is we're trying to play God. We're trying to play God in other people's lives and we're trying to play God in our own I feel guilty of that and I realize it more and more. The more controlling I want to be, the more I realize, oh, Lord, I'm trying to fight a battle. That's not my fight. No wonder what, whatever you're carrying in this morning your tight to fit. Ask the Lord, is this something that you want me to fight? Is this something you want to fight? It's a real question. He wants to give you an answer. The Lord will fight for you, he says. The song goes on. Just to recap, it talks about who God is, his character. It talks about what God has done his works, but it also talks about what God will do. There's a fascinating part of this song, um, starting in verses uh, 13 and onward. The, the song talks about God bringing us into a land and uh, bringing us to the mountain, look at verse 17, of God's inheritance, to a sanctuary. Now, this is strange language for the Israelites. Why? Because we haven't even, we barely got out of Egypt alive. We haven't gone into the promised land yet. We don't even know what the mountain is, but we know that the mountain that he's talking about is, we know that the inheritance is Israel, and the mountain is Mount Moriah. This is the mountain of its inheritance. This is where God will plant the temple, that God will put his very presence so here Moses the prophet, in the Song of Moses, talks about a place, a land that God will give us, talks about a mountain where his sanctuary will be. But the Song of Moses is incomplete. And the title of this message is The Greatest Musical Medley. You know, a musical medley is where you take two or more songs and you kind of blend them together. You know, you kind of hear this on the radio and you sort of hear mashups. Um, and so, one, so it's, a, it's a 
two songs mm. putting together, mm. and it makes a new song. But the Song mm. of Moses is incomplete in and of mm. itself because it points us to another song. Now, why mm. do I say it's incomplete? Because mm. the Jewish people aren't going to find out mm. for many, 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 many years what mm. Moses is talking about. Here. They're mm. not going to see for a long time the inheritance mm. of the mm. land of Israel. They're not going to see for a long time the temple be established mm. on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. So it points us, it leaves us kind of wanting the song mm. of Moses. And it points us to another song where mm. we see what mm. Moses was glimpsing at. Now we can see in full picture. Turn to Revelation 15. John, exiled on the island of Patmos, sees a vision, and he, he hears the song of Moses. Look at verse 3, uh, starting at verse 2. I looked up, and I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image, and over the number of his name. So there's a sea, and there's an enemy, and then there's the people of God who are victorious. Sound familiar? Look at verse 3. He said, They held harps given them by God, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God. So in the end time, we see God's people standing victorious over an enemy, singing the song of Moses. What's the song of Moses? Who God is and what he's done. He's our victory. He's our warrior. But the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Now we have the greatest musical medley. Watch. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Watch this. The Song of Moses is all about the King. It starts off, if you notice... The Lord is highly exalted. That's kingly language, isn't it? So God is our king, Melech HaKavod, king of glory. And it ends with, the song ends with, the, the Lord will reign forever and ever, verse 18. So the, the song of Moses starts and ends with kingly language and has us wanting for something more because we don't realize what it is that God is going to give us. And, and then in Revelation 15, we see that the Song of Moses is actually a medley of the Song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Do you see what's happening? God in his sovereignty is using Moses and John to write, to tie together the greatest musical medley the world has ever seen. God is the King of all the ages. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He is a warrior. And look at what the Song of, of, uh, of, of the Lamb talks about. It follows the same sort of outline as the Song of Moses. Who God is, His character. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. What has He done? Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. All the nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed. Song of Moses. Who God is, what He has done. The Song of the Lamb. Talking about the one Moses faintly pictured in it. How did God deliver us? What has He done? Moses didn't know at that time, although he, he saw it when he was there on the mountain of transfiguration. But he, he wrote about and pointed to a king who would come from heaven. He would go up on the mountain that Moses wrote about. And he would carry every burden. He would carry every sickness. He would carry every sin of his creation that he made. He would climb that mountain of inheritance. And he would deliver us. How would he do that? With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. God, through Yeshua, our Messiah, rescued us with His mighty hands that were pierced. His side that was pierced for us 
and he would deliver us so that we could sing the greatest song in the world, the song of the gospel, the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb, tied together, proclaiming the great deeds of the one who saved us. We never have to forget about what God has done for us. We never have to wonder how much he loves us. Why? Because we remember who he is. He's the king. king. We remember what he's done. He died. He put himself in our place. He lived the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. And he says, I'll rescue you by mighty hand. So, I told you that uh, I, I was in a rock and a hard place and I was stuck and I, I had a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress in my hand. And long story short, 24 hours before I was, less than 24 hours, the night before I was supposed to leave for San Francisco, leaving Hanet and the kids stranded without a van. God used someone in our congregation to help me find a van. We took it to uh, a mechanic. He bumped us up at the head of the line in front of the other two cars. Got it checked out. He even negotiated for me. Praise the Lord. So I didn't have to deal with the salesman. And, um, and God provided a vehicle that was better and cheaper than what I could have ever expected. And, and God, in all, all he had to do was his nostrils were more powerful than all of my strength in trying to fight my battle. Now, praise God. And you know what happens when he fights a battle and we sort of, we, we, we relinquish control, we surrender, we go back into a new one. All of us are currently in a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or heading into a crisis. So if you're not in one now, just thank God for his grace and breathe and blink. If you're in one, thank God for his grace and ask him to fight your battle for you. But not too long uh, ago, our, our van, our miraculous van, which God provided, uh, ended up having a lot of um, work done on it, and it cleared out our savings account. And you know what happened? I went. I wanted to go back to Egypt. I was like, God, I don't know how to handle this. I, 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 this is, all my finances are going to go toward all these expenses. And oh, is it worth it? And, and I started worrying. I started having anxiety. And then I realized, uh, the God who provided it will provide it. For me. And I needed to realize that He was going to fight it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to remember that thing that you're holding on to that you came in. Tighten your fist. Feel that burden in your hand. And I want you to do what I did. Remind myself of the, of, that God is bigger. I, I want you to open your hand. Look at your hand. Say, God's hand is bigger. Say that together. Ready? God's hand is bigger. I want you to walk out of this place today and I don't want you to have closed fists thinking about feeling the weight of the burden that you are in right now because I want you to open it up and I want you to remind yourself multiple times if it takes a day, God's hand is bigger. God's hand is bigger. His hand delivered us from the Egyptians. His hand delivered us from what seemed to be impossible to be rescued from. His hands were pierced so that you could be free. His hand is much bigger than yours. You might feel the weight of the burden, but he felt the weight of the burden of the whole world in his hand. And his hands is what? His hands are... God's hands are bigger. What does that mean practically? It means a couple things. It means that God has this, even if you don't. It's okay if you feel like you're drowning. I've been there. Very recently. 
It's okay, because he's the rescuer. God's mm-hmm. hand is bigger. That means he's got mm-hmm. this. Even if you, you have to trust him in it. He, he's got it. He's in control. What else does it mean that God's hand is bigger? It means he will fight for you. He will fight for you. Now listen to me closely. Some of us tend to believe that God has it out for us. We tend to falsely believe the lie. It's an easy swallow pill. We tend to believe the lie that God is fighting us. I'm here to tell you this morning, thank you. God is not fighting you. He is fighting for you. His hands are bigger, and they're fighting for you. If you hear nothing else from what I say this morning, just remember, God is on your side. He is on your side. He hasn't brought us out to the desert to die. He hasn't brought us out here to starve. He took care of us. Manna from heaven. Sandals didn't wear out. God is fighting for you. His hand is bigger. So what's your part? You can can hold on. You can hold on and try to be God in your own life, but I'll tell you it's not going to work. This morning, you have a choice. God is giving you an invitation to open your hands. Recognize I want you just to invite you just to take a minute and ask God, the Holy Spirit, what would you want me to do with what I've heard? What are you speaking to me? Just take a moment to ask that and listen. I believe that God wants to make some radical shifts in some people's thinking. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind. And some of us need to have our minds renewed. The, the way that you're looking at God, the way you view Him, you're making Him to be your enemy, but He's not your enemy. So Lord, right now, in the name of Yeshua, I pray that you would just move among your people by your Ruach. I pray that you would renew minds that any lies that we've believed, that we would uh, we would call it out and we would believe your truth. Lord, I pray you desire truth in the inner parts. Right now, Lord, I just speak to hopelessness and I speak hope in people's hearts. Lord, I speak life where there's death. I speak hope where there's despair. Father, you are fighting for us and I pray that we would believe it and receive it today. Help us to surrender to you, arms, hands wide open, realizing you can do more with your pinky than we can do with all of our strength. You are a great.